Welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon for physical therapy for neck pain. My name is Kathy Chern and I'm a consumer health librarian at East Brunswick Public Library. Today's program is brought to you by Spineck Physical Therapy and the Libraries Just for the Health of It initiative to promote community health and wellness. Our speaker today is Devanchi Modi, owner and physical therapist at Spineck Physical Therapy. Please be aware that this talk is being recorded. Participants' microphones are automatically muted and webcams off. When ready, the recording will be available at ebpl.org slash YouTube. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. Our speaker will answer questions at the end of the talk, and our speaker will not be able to offer medical advice to attendees during this program. And without further ado, I'll turn things over to Devanchi. Thanks, Kathy. I thank East Brunswick Public Library for the opportunity to let me talk to everyone today. It's a nice snowing afternoon, and I welcome you all to join the talk. Today, we are going to talk about physical therapy for neck pain. Uh, I am the owner of Spine Neck Physical Therapy. We are a physical therapy practice in East Brunswick. I specialize in spine, so neck and back has been my domain for most part. And uh, let's talk about neck pain. So what are we going to learn today? We are going to learn three simple things. What is neck pain? Why do you get neck pain? And how do we treat neck pain? And at the end, I'm gonna show you the basic and simple exercises that you can do it during your day-to-day -day routine, during your desk work, or if you have neck pain, very simple stretches and strengthening exercises. I want to spend more time on exercises as compared to theory because that is most of the time the takeaway message that you want to take it for, for good. So let's begin. What is neck pain? Neck pain is a very common condition. It is a very common complaint. What happens is you feel pain at the center of the neck right in the, or in one side of the shoulder blade, it is a feeling of tightness or stiffness that is very gripping. It is a kind of nagging complaint that you feel that, oh my God, I really need to hold onto my neck for me to feel better. I wish somebody would just crack my neck or my upper back. It is so, it is so annoying. And most of the time it, it starts to come in towards the end of the day when you have sat for six, four, five hours at work on your desk, or it comes in early in the mornings when you wake up, when you're very stiff. So it's, it's very disturbing. It is the fourth leading cause of disability and the annual, annual prevalence rate of neck pain is around 30%. That means that around 30% of adults in US experience neck pain in one year out of which around 50% would have chronic complaints of re recurrence of pain. Most of the times, this neck pain is also associated with pain on the outer arm. There's a feeling of heaviness and um, a heaviness and tingling in the hands. By tingling, I mean pins and needles going down to your hands and your arms. Some people do experience numbness. By numbness, I mean that they don't feel the tip of their fingertips. It also comes with weakness. If the neck pain progresses to weakness, it is, it's difficulty to hold on to objects. It's doing small grips and pinches is difficult. And all of that can be very disturbing and it can be very, very painful. Sometimes, Neck pain, neck pain can also lead to headaches. There is the fascia at the back of the neck, which can be very tight and stiff, which can lead to pressure on the nerves supplying the head. And there could be pain at the back of the head, which can lead to headaches. Now, let's review the normal anatomy. How does the normal body look like? So this is a normal human persons looking through a side view. There are four major curves, the cervical, thoracic, 
lumbar, and sacrum. Today, we are going, going to talk about the cervical area or the purple area that you see here. There are, these bones are called the vertebrae and they are seven in number. If you had to zoom into those, we could see that each vertebrae looks like this. In the center, what you see is the intervertebral disc or the disc. The yellow is the nerves. This disc is jelly-like. It can move around. It has fluidity. If you had to simply see it, this is one bone, the top vertebrae. The second bone or the bottom vertebrae. The disc or the jelly and the nerve. Now, what happens with neck pain? This is an x-ray of a neck. With normal aging or wear and tear, there is rubbing of bone against each other. And that rubbing is called as cervical spondylosis. I hear a lot of people tell me that, oh, my doctor has diagnosed with me cervical spondylosis. I have cervical spawn. I have spondylosis. Spondylosis is nothing but just regular wear and tear of your spine. And what happens with this rubbing is there are a small structures called osteophytes, which grow at the edges of the vertebrae, which inflame the structures around and cause now this wear and tear can happen at different levels. And that's why sometimes people say, oh, I have C3, C4 spondylosis. Some people say I have C5, C6 spondylosis. So it totally varies on what you do. For example, if it was a painter, he would look up to the ceiling and paint the ceiling. That would kind of cause spondylosis at a upper segment. If I'm a computer professional and spend a lot of time looking at the computer and looking forward head, that would probably cause more rubbing or wear and tear at a lower level. And that rubbing is called cervical spondylosis. So cervical spondylosis is nothing but just regular wear and tear leading to inflammation, muscle tightness and stiffness. This causes pain while turning your head or moving your head from side to side. Now, let's see another common condition. So let's talk about the next condition. It's called the herniated disc or slip disc as a lot of people mention. This is going back to our normal anatomy again the bones and the vertebra. The bones are the vertebra and the disc. Now, what happens if this disc, which is fluid-like, compresses on the nerve? So as you see here, if there is something wrong with this disc and it puts pressure on the nerve, it inflames the nerve and causes pinching of the nerve. And that is what is pinched nerve. So pinch nerve is also a very common condition that you keep hearing. Now, with this inflammation or the disc being pressure here, what happens is every time you bend forward or you do a particular movement, the fluid compresses more on the nerve leading to pain. And when this nerve is pinched, it kind of causes pain all the way down to your arm and your hand. And this causes the tingling and the numbness, which we spoke earlier in the symptoms part. So this is pinch nerve or cervical radiculopathy. Now, this is like a electrical wire. If there is a wire which starts from the neck 
and runs all the way down to your hand. And imagine there is something off with the insulation at the top. If there's something off with the insulation and it wears off, there could be pain going down all the way to your hand, leading symptoms in the hand. And that's why people get this feeling of paresthesias, or by, by paresthesia, I mean pins, needles. It's like a Charlie horse kind of sensation where you feel symptoms down your hand. So that was another very common condition on why do you get neck pain is a pinched nerve. One more thing is the muscle spasms. I hear this a couple of times and I see a lot of patients in the clinic would say, I was fine last night. I slept wrong and I woke up with my head like that. That is an acute spasm. By spasm, I mean shortening of the muscle here on the shoulder blade, which leads to pain called trapezitis. So trapezius is the name of the muscle of the shoulder blade, which starts on your head and runs all the way to your shoulder blade. So this is the trapezius. And when this muscle goes into spasm, it's called trapezitis. The therapy to this is you, people take muscle relaxes, over-the-counter painkillers, and do physical therapy for your movements to come back to what it was. So we discussed about four different conditions, very common conditions of the neck, which lead to neck pain. Cervical spondylosis, herniated disc or slip disc, the, the pinched nerve or cervical radiculopathy, and trapezitis or muscle spasm. Now, why do you get this neck pain? Why does it happen? Any ideas? The most common cause of neck complaints is poor posture. You don't sit right, you don't stand right, you get that neck pain. Let's have a look at this picture. Is this very common seen in, in our teens or even us? We're looking at the cell phones, looking all the way down with the neck and upper back bent, maybe sitting, sitting on a sofa set and ha having this posture. How about this? Working with laptops, working on the computer screen for six to eight hours a day. In the last two years, there has been a 60% rise in the screen time of, of students as well as adults. People spend at least eight to 10 hours on screens minimum. Now, what is wrong with all these postures? What is happening is the neck is going into more of a forward position or a forward head position. Now, what is wrong with forward head? It's fine, I'm comfortable doing this posture, but every time your head moves in a forward position, there is an increased force on the neck. So if it was straight up, there's a 12 pound. If it is a one inch forward, 32 pound. And around two inch forward, 42 pound. So just imagine the 10 pound dumbbells, the heavy ones, four of them. If you put on your neck, how would it feel? That much amount of force is generated on your neck when you sit incorrectly with a forward neck position like that or when you bend like that and sustain it for looking at your cell phones or computer screens. Four 10 pound dumbbell weight. That's a lot of weight. So when we see this gentleman working on his laptop, 
in a good ergonomic office chair, he's still sitting incorrectly. You can have the best of the chair, but still can have the worst possible posture, just like this. I mean, it, it looks fine. What, what is wrong with it? Let's have a look. The same gentleman here. Let's see. The first thing, the eyes are not directed straight. It is at an angle right here. So monitor is not at eye level. The neck part. The neck is assuming a lot of forward head position, bending it at a different angle. The upper back or the thorax that is completely rounded and bent, leading to a lot of stretch to the areas which are at the back, round back. Let's see what's happening to the low back. It's completely unsupported, low back. What's happening to the elbow angles? The hands and the elbows are not supported. They either have to be supported on the table itself or on the armrest of the chair, which is off. And the next one is the wrist angle, which is bent like this. When we work, the wrist neither has to be up nor down, has to be straight, not tensing any of those spots. So how should the correct posture look like? Correct posture, I'm going to start off with this area, your low back. The low back is the foundation of your entire spine. So if you fix your low back correctly, you're sorted. Everyone, as you're sitting right now, I want you to watch your posture. See, if you are sitting on your chair, where is the back of your buttock? Most of the times, it's up here. Ideally, the part, the, the, this part of the hip should be touching all the way to the back of the chair. So you have to sit up straight. You could roll up a towel and put it in the gap between the chair and the back, giving a nice support and a straight up posture. If you want, you could use something which is called as a lumber roll right here. Most ergonomic chairs have an inbuilt curve right here, which supports your back firmly. So either a towel roll or a lumber roll and making sure that your seat is touching all the way to the back of the chair, giving yourself a good upright posture. So once you fix this, you're going to be straight up. So you start off with fixing your lumbar spine. The next one, after we fix the lumbar spine, we fix the upper back. So you're not going to slouch. You make sure you have your upper back straight. And how do we do that? By making sure that we are very close to the computer screen. We use our leg room to the fullest. If you see this gentleman here, it's all the way to the inside, making sure that his leg room is right here. Once you support your low back, what happens is your foot will kind of come off, especially with people who have a little less height. What we could do is either lower the chair or have a footrest to support your legs firmly. So if you have a little footrest here, your back is going to be more supported. So to review again, we started off with fixing the back using a footrest 
using a complete leg space of your table. So don't stack up things there. Make sure you have enough leg room for yourself. Pull yourself all the way in. The next one is your forearms. They have to be supported on the table. If the table is too high, you're going to tense this area. We don't want that. It has to be at a good height so that you are not tensing the, this part of the neck. So you're gonna be here. And then you use a external keyboard and an external mouse. That is a must because when you use a laptop, what happens is you are forced to use the computer screen, the, this, the, the keyboard of the laptop and you will have little wiggle room around the flexibility of how you can position your arms and your eye level. So even if you're using a laptop, stack it up, put it on a, on a, in a way that your eyes are at an eye level to the monitor, and then you have your keyboard, which you can position a little far away and then work there. And you have a mouse there. When you're controlling the mouse, the movement has to happen from the elbow and not the wrist because very very frequently we find a lot of people getting something called as the carpal tunnel where you find pins and needles in your hands because of wear and tear of the wrist now so the eyes have to be at the straight angle your upper back is not supposed to be rounded and straight your low back supported back touching all the way to the back of the seat. Your legs should be at an angle of 90 to 100 degrees, this knee angle, and the foot supporting tight here. Now you tell me, Devanshi, we all are not robots. We cannot keep sitting like this all day. I'm working for eight hours, nine hours a day. I possibly cannot sit like this. And I completely agree with you. You cannot sit like this for all day long. So what am I supposed to do? What you need is a take, take frequent breaks. Take 25, 30 minutes of break. But, but how is it possible? I am working. All you need to do is just stand up and stretch. You could still be working. You could just stretch a little bit, stretch a little bit, and then sit back. Doesn't take too long. You're not interrupted and you could still carry on with your routine and make sure you are supported again. And how about this posture? Does this look good? Yeah, that, that I, I hope people are not feeling like this right now. Now, how to treat neck pain. So if I already have neck pain, what can be done? So physical therapy is definitely one of the approaches. And what I'm going to teach, uh, talk about is how we could do it at home as well. However, if the pain has been chronic, that means it has been ongoing for on and off for around three months to four months, you definitely need to address it. To have pain every evening is not normal. To feel some kind of ache and stiffness and tightness, at the end of the day is not normal. To wake up with pain is not normal. We need to fix it. So for, in physical therapy, a correct assessment is extremely important. We have McKenzie form of assessment. What is McKenzie? McKenzie is a kind of manual therapy which, which evaluates and treats. And it is more which empowers patients by that, I mean you can treat your own neck. You need to find out why is the neck hurting and then you can fix it by yourself. So it is extremely important to have correct evaluation of your neck. We need to take a holistic approach. By that, I mean we need to make sure that the pain at the neck is coming. Why is it coming? And by that, I mean, you need to rule out if it's coming from your shoulders or your rib cage. Is there any breathing troubles which is causing neck pain? So we need to find out why is the pain coming? Physical therapists will be able to help you with that. And 
how can I treat my own pain? If I have pain, if it's hurting, what can I do? It's very easy to take an over-the-counter painkiller and you're good, but that, that doesn't fix it. We need to find out why is it happening and we need to take care of it. If there's a lot of pain and tightness that you feel, what you could do at home is either a hot pack or a cold pack. There are a very easy microwavable hot packs that you could put it in the microwave, do it for two to three minutes and put it on. That kind of gives a nice moist heat at the neck, which relaxes the muscles. A very frequent question that I encounter is, is hot good or cold good? Should I do heat for my neck or should I do cold for my neck? The answer to this question is, it totally depends on you. But what I would recommend is if, if there is very acute pain, by acute pain, I mean, you slept okay last night, you woke up today with a dry neck, generally, cold helps better. But I completely agree with your personal preference. If hot helps somebody more, hot, do hot. If cold helps someone more, do cold. I mean, if it's snowy, it's as snowy outside like today, I would probably not like a cold pack and would want a hot pack, but do it. Taking a hot shower also helps, but you can be in the hot shower for 15, 20 minutes. So what you need is something that would stay on. So I would highly recommend the moist heating pads or the, the cold packs that you could keep them on. So how often we need to do the hot packs? Two to three times or as required? How long does the hot packs have to be, uh, be on for? Recommended time is 15 to 20 minutes. Another thing what you can do to fix your own neck is the stretches and the strengthening, which we are definitely going to cover towards the end of the lecture. But what happens is people say that there are a lot of knots that I feel in my neck. The neck feels really tight. The neck feels stiff. And what we need to do for that is you could use a self massager to do a trigger point release. That typically helps with pain. So you just work on the tight spot and release it. How does this work is when you, what happens is when it's in a lot of pain, it goes in a state of shortened position. And to relax that, even if you move, there's something inside which doesn't let it move. It kind of holds on there. And for that, you need to gently release it. So if you take that, realize it, it helps. People use lacrosse balls or a tennis ball to work on the knot. That works great too. So to do your own pain, to treat your own pain, a hot pack or a cold pack, a trigger point release. And there are very important exercises which I'm gonna to cover towards the end of the session, which uh, there is one exercise that I definitely want you all to try if you have neck pain. And, and I think that would help. Uh, I will go on, uh, I, will, I will review when we are covering the exercises. One more question. Should I use a pillow if I have neck pain? Is the pillow recommended? not recommended? What is the right size of the pillow? What is a good pillow? What is a cervical pillow? A lot of questions around the topic pillow. Please do not stop using a pillow if you have neck pain. A pillow is a must, but what kind of pillow you use is very important. There are three things which we consider when we use a pillow. The thickness of the pillow, the, the firmness of the pillow, and the positioning of the pillow. The 
thickness, firmness, positioning. So let's start with the first one, thickness. The thickness of the pillow depends on how you sleep the majority of your night. If you sleep on your back, or if you sleep on your side, or if you sleep on your stomach. What happens if I keep switching between those? Yeah, then you consider the one in which you spend your majority of the time. That would be your predominant position. Now, every time you sleep, you should have a thickness so that the neck stays in a straight alignment. So if I am a side sleeper and I spend majority of my time sleeping on my side, I would need a pillow which would cover from my top of my shoulder blade right here to my ear low. So this much of thickness. So people who have broad shoulders need a thicker pillow when they lie on their side. People with short, uh, not as broad shoulders need a small thickness. So the way it works is it should keep your head in a straight or a neutral alignment. If my pillow was too thick, it would push me upwards like this. If my pillow was too thin, it would push me inwards. That would kind of cause a strain on the muscles of the neck right here. And this would keep it in a straight alignment. The same goes when we lie on our back. When we lie on our back, we need a pillow size just enough for us to cover between the, the nape of the neck to the floor. If it is too low, it's going to push the head backwards. If it is too high, it's going to push it all the way to the front. So you need to have the right size of the pillow to keep it straight. I mean, I know a lot of people who would have two huge pillows stacked up in bed on which they lay down. If the pillow is all the way to the shoulder blades, they're watching television or working on their laptops and fall asleep that way. I mean, that's totally the best way to ruin your neck. So that was about the size of the pillow. Second point, how firm should be the pillow? If the pillow is very fluffy and soft, your head would kind of dig into it. If it's too firm, that's not good too. So what is the right, right firmness? So the right firmness is fold a towel into four or fold a bed sheet into four. And when you lay down on it, the amount of firmness that you feel, that is the right firmness that you need when you sleep. People talk a lot about memory foam, cervical pillows, Memory foam also takes the shape of your neck. Not really recommended. How, what is a cervical pillow? What cervical pillows does is cervical pillows is for, a, for people who keep switching their positions between a, a back sleeper and a side feet sleeper. So they have two curves on them. So you can decide where do you want to be. And the last one, pillow positioning. The pillow should end at your neck when you're laying on your back. And when you're laying on your side, it should snugly fit in the nape of your neck. It should not cross beyond your shoulder or below your shoulder. So this is all I have for pillow talk. And how to treat neck pain. Stretch, strengthen, straighten up. We already spoke about straightening up, correct postures, correct way to use cell phones. Whenever you use a cell phone, never do like that. Put your hand like this and look at the cell phone. Instead of writing an email like that, if you have a long email to type, go on to your desktop or your laptop. Do not type it on your phone. I'm gonna show you exercises to stretch, strengthen, 
Let me just get you the basics of how these exercises work. Now, every time we are rounded up, we are here. This part in the front gets very tight. So I'm gonna show you exercises that will help you stretch this area. And we need to strengthen the area at the back. So we are going to stretch our pectorals and strengthen our rhomboids. I'm going to strengthen the deep neck flexors and stretch the inhibited, the tight neck muscles. So let's go on for exercise demonstrations. So the first exercise I'm going to show you. Everybody see me properly? You could do it in sitting as well. The first one is for your shoulder blade muscles. So when we are all rounded up, we want to straighten up. Even if you're not rounded up, it's a good idea to straighten up. The first and the foremost exercise is you put your hands right here next to each other. And then take your hands to the back. So what you're doing is trying to squeeze your shoulder blades. So if these are your shoulder blades, you're trying to get them as close to each other as possible. So they go kissing to each other and come back. So your idea is to bring your shoulder blades to the back. Let me show you. Bring your shoulder blades to the back and come back. Bring your shoulder blades to the back and come back. Three, four, five, one, two, three, excellent, four, and so when you do that, it kind of opens up the front. It helps you feel the muscle at the back. And that is absolutely normal to do it. So squeeze and back. Squeeze and back. You could start off by doing two sets of 10. And every time you do it, you want to hold it for like a count of three or four. So Capital squeezes and back. So that is a very important exercise to open up. So that was my first one. The next one that we are going to do, the snow angels. Today's the perfect weather to make snow angels, but we're gonna just do it here. <laughs> so you're gonna have your hands up like this. And now try and take it back and down. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to squeeze the shoulder blades together like they are tipping down like this closer to each other. If you do not feel the muscle right here, then you're not doing it correctly. You should feel the area between the two shoulder blades. So you have your hands up, squeeze and back. Perfect. Squeeze and back. Three. Four. When you do that, make sure the neck doesn't jut forward. The neck stays where it is. It's like an airplane going back. One. Perfect. Two. Three. Four. Every time, feel the two shoulder blades coming closer to each other. It's just not a shoulder movement. It's a movement of the shoulder blade. It's those two trying to come closer to each other. Six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Excellent. 
So we did our scapular squeezes back and we did snow angels. The third one that we're gonna do today is your neck stretch or called the trapezius stretch. What we can do is hold on to the chair or the table on which you're sitting right here. With the other hand, can you still hear me? Hold the head and side stretch. Go to your side and pull it. You feel a very good pull up here. If you don't, then just go a little more forward. So from neck to a side and to the front, count 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and back. Holding this down kind of anchors and stabilizes this. Same way. Grab onto the other side with this hand. Hold it here. Side bend, forward bend. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is a stretch. If you want, you could hold it for a count of 20. If you want and you do not want to grab the chair, you want a deeper stretch, just put your hand at the back, forward and side. One, two, so the head goes to the other side. If your left hand is back, your head goes to the right side. Yes, that's perfect. Excellent. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If you want for a little more deeper stretch, just work around how you feel. If you want, just move it a little forward, otherwise to the side. So this was the third exercise. We did the we did the scapular squeezes, we did snow angels, and then we did the trapezius stretch or the shoulder blade stretch. The next one that we are going to do is a fun one. It's called the upper back stretch or thoracic extension. Let's make an upper back stretch. You could have a seat on a firm chair. This is very helpful for people who work on computers a lot and are slouch for most of the time. People who have a fixed curve, it might be difficult to do it because your spine is already in this position. So this is more of an extreme position. So people who have a fixed kyphosis, that might be a little tough one, but computer professionals and people having a straighter back can try this. Sit at the edge of the chair. Now with both your hands, support your neck. So you anchor your neck nice and firm and go on the edge of the chair and well, that feels good and come back. And come back. Perfect. So to have the right height of the chair when you're doing this exercise is important. If you have a higher chair, you will feel the stretch much more in the upper area. And make sure you do it on a stable chair. You don't want to topple at the back. <laughs> so this, was, this is very helpful for people who work on computers. Kind of just pulls everything out and stretches everything out. So that was your thoracic extension. The next one, now this is um, a tricky exercise. It's difficult to comprehend, but it is a must, must try for people who have neck pain. For people who it works, it works miracles. And for people 
it's just difficult to understand that exercise, but it's called a chin tuck. By chin tuck, I mean, you're going to make a double chin. So it's like making a double chin. You're not looking down. It's a very subtle movement, but it is absolutely reverse of what you have. So if you do all this all day long, you might want to just bring your chin in and feel a very good stretch. An easier way to do this is if you have your head, hand up here and with the other hand, guide your chin to the back. One, two, three, four, five. You know you're doing it correctly if you feel a stretch from here to here. Again, if you have ongoing neck pain, definitely try this. It works wonders. Mackenzie, the whole science works on this exercise. It's again, a very tricky exercise to learn it, but if you get it right, it's perfect. So chin in and back. One, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So these are called chin tucks. And one good exercise for people who are working on the computers all day to stretch your arms. You're scared. You want to avoid all the carpal tunnel like syndrome. One, two, three, four, five. 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 Excellent. You guys are doing great. So we did scapular squeezes, snow angels, uh, neck stretch, thoracic stretch or upper back stretch chin tucks, and arm stretches. Do this as a part of your daily exercises. If you're on the screen, this doesn't take too long. It just takes a couple of minutes. I don't want you to do like 30, 40 of them. Just do five, seven of them every hour, every two hours. It definitely helps you. Just very, very small things like using your phone like this just as a habit, sitting more upright, sitting on the sofas or your recliner chairs, much more upright, sitting with a back support. I mean, I've seen people sitting very incorrectly even with back support, but making sure that they <laughs> excellent. And then you go straight up and perfect. Avoid sitting on bean bags, avoid sitting on very comfy, sofas very very cushiony sit straighter that's very helpful i mean my only to go message for today if i have to say is use your pillows at night correctly use your chairs correctly stretch very often i mean my my husband really tells me that you you don't even let me be in bed. Like you don't want me to sleep, like you want me to sleep correctly. What do you want me to do? It's very important to have it as an integral part of our daily routine. It's just, just, just be you. And especially with remote learning, kids are going online all the time. Eight hours, 10 hours of screen time is not something that really want. So this is my real request that Start sitting up straight, stretching more often, exercising more often to just be healthy. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so thank you everyone for attending. And thank you so much, Devanshi, for taking the time to present and also to show us all these different, like wonderful demonstrations and exercises that we can do. So again, all. thank you everyone for joining yeah. and um, take care and stay safe.